thank y'all so much. I do go through a lot, like starting in March, I start going, oh my God, I only got eight more weeks. Oh my God, I gotta, you know, it makes, yeah, like I'm so nervous, I can't stand it. But um, if I can just be me with y'all, I'll feel, I'll, I'll just be real a whole lot better. If I don't have to impress or act like somebody I'm not, I, I, I can do this. So anyway, we're gonna, today's message is called From Low to Bar to the King's Table. And I'm not sure uh, some of you may have read this story before, but a lot of you may not. So I'm going to read, we're going to read a good bit um, this morning. It's 2 Samuel 9, 1 through 13. And you just follow along with me and try to, to grasp what's going on here. David asked, is there anyone still left in the house of Saul whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake. Now Jonathan was David's very best friend. He happened to be the son of King Saul. He was the son of the king. And Jonathan and um, David had made a pact with each other. And they were like, D Jonathan said, if anything happens to me, please, please show kindness to the rest of my family. Can you please find if I have anybody else, you know, in my family left that you would just show kindness to? So, you know, you gotta remember they're they're in war with the Philistines, and Jonathan and his dad, Saul, King Saul and Jonathan, both die on the same day. The very same day they both died and the Philistines chased them down and then we come to where David's anointed now to king and so he, he is whispering, the Holy Spirit whispers in his ear, let me just, so he says, is there anyone left who I can show kindness to for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They summoned him to appear before David and the king said to them, to him, are you Ziba? He said, at your service, he replied. And the king asked, is there no one still alive from the house of Saul whom I can show kindness? Because David had looked, and, you know, and he hadn't heard of anybody being alive from Saul's reign, you know, from his bloodline. So the king asked if there was anybody. Then they said, okay. There is still a son of Jonathan, but he's lame in both feet. He was crippled in both feet. So what happened was, when the, Philist when the Philistines were coming to Israel to invade them, the nurse, he was five years old, and the nurse, his, his nanny or his uh, nursemaid, picked him up and was running really fast with him to get him away from. Now you have to realize, this guy's name is Mephibosheth. Can you say that, Mephibosheth? I mean, that's a mouthful. Why you just couldn't call him Phoebe or something? I don't know. But anyway, Mephibosheth is his name. So the nurse was holding Mephibosheth and she was running with him to keep him safe. He was third in line before uh, his dad, and, you know, he would have been number three to be king, Mephibosheth. But David was anointed instead. So anyway, there's still a son, but he's lame in both feet. Well, where is he? Asked the king. And Ziba answered, he is at the house of Makur, son of Amiel in Lodabar. So King David told him um, he had him brought from Lodabar. Now, let me, let me explain something to you about Lodabar. Lodabar was like a ghetto. Low, Lodabar. It was, it was like a ghetto. The people in Lodabar were people that were hopeless. They were hopeless. They were poor. They were run down. They had nobody. This is where you go to Lodabar if you have 
if you're an outcast. And that's pretty much what all of Lodabar was. There was nothing healthy growing in Lodabar. There was no word coming from the Lord to Lodabar. It was just a bad, bad place. Well, there he is. Mephibosheth is in Lodabar. So the King David told, um, brought him from Lodabar. Now they had to go. What, what would happen was the nurse, I didn't finish telling you about, she's running, that she's running to keep Mephibosheth safe. And as she runs, she trips. Now he's five then, and she trips and she falls, and he becomes crippled in both of his, both of his feet. He can't move, he can't walk, he's crippled. So, there's still a son. He's at the house of Amiel and Lodabar. So King David had him brought from Lodabar, from the house of Makur, son of Amiel. Now listen, he couldn't... When he went, when David sends his men over to Lodabar to get Mephibosheth, they were a nervous wreck because here comes the king. And here comes all of them men. And they are all decked out in their, you know, uh, kingly attire, what they serve the king wearing. Well, they panicking. You know, they're like, oh my God. So he says, we need Mephibosheth. We need Mephibosheth to come with us. The king is calling. And Mephibosheth was like, oh my God, he, he was a nervous wreck. So um, when Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth? And he said, at your service. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul, and you will always eat at my table. And Mephibosheth bowed down and said, Well, what is your servant? What am I that you would notice a dead dog like me? Oh, man. I mean, he grew up. You know, he's not five any longer. And after he got hurt, they throw him down in Lodabar. And there's, he's just been like a dead dog. So the king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, and he said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, Your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah. He went on to have a family. And all the members of Ziba's household were servants of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. He was still lame in both feet. Well, I'm going to tell you, how many of you can relate to Mephibosheth? I know there's people in here that feel like, see, Mephibosheth was dropped. Mephibosheth was dropped, and it was not his fault. It was no fault of his own. He didn't want to be dropped. He didn't want to live his life in Lodabar. But because of somebody else's mistake, Mephibosheth is crippled for the rest of his life. And sometimes that happens with us because of different people's uh, treating of us or the way we were raised or the way we were brought up. You know, I mean, uh, really, I don't think anybody, you know, whether you were in a family that cared so much for you or whether you were in a family that was not so caring and you, you just kind of made it out for yourself. You know, you made up for yourself. You feel like you've been dropped. Maybe in your marriage, in your marriage life, you feel like, oh God, I've been dropped. I've been dropped and God, I'm, this is done. Or maybe your health, maybe there's sickness and you feel like, God, it's not my fault. I, it's not my fault I'm sick. It's not my fault I got dropped. And, um, but you know what? We may have been dropped, but God knows how to pick us up. 
He's the one who knows how to pick us up. So God, whatever it is you're going through, however in your, in your situation that you've been dropped, God has not forgotten about you. He has not forgotten about you. And uh, God is a God of justice, let me tell you. And I could see, you know, if somebody, if a person has treated you wrong and done you wrong and you wasn't raised in the best, of, it wasn't because they intentionally meant to do that. You know, sometimes parents, mom and dads, they, they, or teaching their kids and raising their kids the way they were taught and raised. And it really wasn't their fault. They never meant to be like that towards you or maybe you've been dropped in your job and you just, you know, promotion has come and gone to someone else. God knows where you are. He sees you and he's not forgotten and he will, he will see that justice. You know, God's not a God that's looking and going, oh, that's too bad, man. You lost your job. That's too bad. Oh, you know, oh, man, your marriage is, you, you go on for divorce. That's just too bad. He's not saying that. That's not the kind of God we serve, okay? He's, he's a God of justice, and he's going to see justice come for you. He's going to see justice come for you. So, no, he says, uh-uh. He looks at us and goes, that's, you my child. You are my, you are my prized possession. You moms know how you feel about your kids in here? How, oh man, I tell, I tell mine all the time, I would lay in the street and let a truck run over me for you. That's how much I love you. I just lay down my life for you. And you know, well, so much more is God for us. How much more does God love us than a human can? He's God. How much more? So let me tell you something. When God goes to work for you, when God goes to work on your behalf, there is no power, there's no force in hell that can reckon with him. There's not a person that can stand against him. There's not a person that can fight against him. There's not a sickness that can stop him. There is nothing that can stop God from moving. No matter what that sickness is called, God can move and overcome every situation that we have. Finances, betrayal, nothing of that can stop him. I mean, he's the God of the universe, okay? So God has not forgotten you. David was sitting on his throne one day, like every other day, and the Holy Spirit whispers into his ear. Be kind to find out if there's anybody left in the house of Saul. He says, because I want you to be kind to him. You know, he's hearing that whisper by the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you something. The Holy Spirit can whisper in somebody's ear at any given time to be kind to you, to change your situation, to make things that look like it would never turn around. God is able to whisper in that person's ear to turn your situation around, to turn that sickness around, to turn those finances around. I mean, God is the God of the impossible. We're just saying about that. There's nothing too difficult for him. When did I stop believing? Oh, man, that got me. Because there'd be times when a situation seems so great. It seems so big, and I go, I mean, God, you can do it. This is what I say. Not anymore. I try not to. God, you can do it. I know you can, but will you? So that's doubt. See, I know you can, but will you? That's doubt. So God has not forgotten me, and he hasn't forgotten you. And, and there's a scripture in the Bible that says, here's your right hand, that says, your name is written in the palm of his righteous right hand. Okay, that, think about that. I mean, that's a lot of names to go in the palm of a hand, right? I'd have a hard time getting all of y'all's names in my palm. That's because the hand of God has to be so very big. His hand has to be so very big that he's able to move any situation you got. Any situation that you're in, his hand is so big. And every time he opens that hand, whether he opens his hand to scratch his nose, he's looking, your name's there. 
Your name is always before him. To me, I thought that was pretty powerful. So I can't, I can't get away from him because my name is always, he can't get away from me. My name is tattooed in the palm of his hand. So is yours. So back to Mephibosheth, we know he had to pay the price for somebody else's mistake. And both King Saul and when both King Saul and Jonathan were killed on the same day, that was David's opportunity to come into kingship. And you know, it was, it's funny because King Saul was anointed to be king at 13 years old. 13, he was anointed to be king. Well, he was appointed to be king. Um, forget it. I said wrong. See? So, not Saul. David. King David was appointed to be king. Remember, he went to his daddy and they found him and he said, oh, this is him, the youngest one out there feeding the sheep. That's the one that's going to be king. God appointed him at 13 to be king. But he did not become king for how many years? I think he was 26. 13 more years. 13 years he watched Saul do all of these bad things. I mean, he watched Saul turn from a godly man to an ungodly man. And he, he could have killed Saul twice. And you know what? He didn't. He didn't. And he could have said, I'm just going to kill him because I know I'm going to be king. I was anointed to be king back when I was 13. Uh-huh. He said I could. But you know what? He waited his time. And that's what happens with us. We got to wait our time. God has something and it may not happen at this very moment. Don't get discouraged because that's what happened. We give up. Man, I've been praying. I told you last week, you know, 38 years my mom prayed. 38 years. There's been people that are sitting in here that are praying for situations that have been years. You, you have been praying for years and you haven't seen a turnaround yet. Don't give up. There's an there's an uh, uh, anointed time and there's an appointed time. Okay? So King David was anointed when he was 13. They poured the oil on him. He anointed him to be king. But he did not get appointed till he was 26. So for 13 years, everything, can you imagine everything that happened? He was probably like, oh, I wouldn't do it that way. If I was king, I wouldn't do it that way. Or if he was thinking to himself, oh man, I'm going to be king. I just want to go over there and sh shoot them all up. Just kill them all. I don't like it. I'm going I'm to take care of it. But he didn't. He knew how to wait upon the Lord. Okay? He knew how to wait upon the Lord. And that's what we got to do. We got to learn how, God, I give you what I need. I give you my dropped state that I'm in. I've been dropped, God. I give it to you. Now I'm going to wait and I'm going to trust that you're coming through for me. He is. He had All things are working together for your good. If you love the Lord. All things are working together for your good. And what did he say? You are more than conquerors. Not just a conqueror. Oh man, I'm a conqueror. No, I'm more than a conqueror. And so are you. So God is going to bring these things to pass that he's promised you. You just got to hold on for the appointed time, okay? So we talked about Lodabar, how people were just there to die. That's where Mephibosheth was. Mephibosheth was just waiting to die. And he was royal. Can you imagine that? No matter where he was, no matter where Mephibosheth was, he was royal. He had royal blood. His grandpa was king. His daddy was going to be in line to be king, and then he was going to be king. And it's uh, amazing. You know, I don't know if any of y'all watched um, the coronation with King Charles. Did you watch it? I just love that stuff. I think I'm, I'm just like a princess all the way down deep inside. <laughs> I'm thinking, that could be me. No. <laughs> but anyway... Um, I watched that in the royalty. I mean, it is so royal. And I, I, I watched that while I was studying this, and I was like, that's what Mephibosheth was. He was Prince William's little boy. He was coming into until he got hurt and he got thrown in the ghetto. 
in a place where he was just going to die. But let me tell you something. This is not the end of Mephibosheth's story. It's not the end of his story. I mean, when Mephibosheth got called by David, he must have been petrified. He must have been saying, they found out I'm alive and they're coming to kill me. They found out that I'm the last one of King Saul's relatives and he's coming to kill me. I could see that happening. But that's not the end of his story. Oh my gosh. God whispered, you know, to David to go take care of him and that's exactly what he's going to do. So they carry in Mephibosheth and he goes before the king. And David said, don't be afraid. Justice is coming. And that's what the Lord says to you today. Don't be afraid. Justice is coming. Your justice is coming. I don't know what it is, but I know it's coming. And you got to keep it. <laughs> I, I, I bet you he was still like, what did I do? He said, I'm a dead dog. You ever feel like a dead dog? I mean, God says, who are we that God is mindful of us. There's a scripture that says, who am I that the God of this universe, I mean, a God of this universe knows who I am, tattoos his hand, I mean, my name in the middle of his hand. That's just amazing to me. I mean, I always, I was telling Derek this, uh, back in the day, and very, very, very back in the day, you had your car, you know, uh, guys had their car. And I remember they'd go to the hardware store and buy these gold letters. They were about this, you know, about three, maybe three by four inches. And they'd put their girlfriend's name on the back of the car. I was like, that is cool. Well, you know, I, um, that is really cool. I'm going to try to get Derek to put my name on the back of this car. It didn't happen. I'm not going to school with your name. I'm not going to look like you beat up. I was very, very, very disheartened about that. Like, he didn't want to put my name on the back of his car. And you know, I was 13 years old when I uh, first started, when I first fell in love with him. And, um, I know. I'm, I, if I was my mom and daddy, I don't know how they allowed me to have. Yeah, I don't know. I would not want that for my grandkids. Uh-uh. I mean, although you were great. I mean, you are great. You are great. But that was a little too young. But back in the day, that's when you did. You, um, you know, you found your, your boyfriend early. But anyway, he still wouldn't put his name on the back of my car. On the back of his car. My name. And I begged him. I said, I mean, everybody's doing it. Everybody's got their name on the back of their car. And he's like, I ain't putting your name on the back of my car. <laughs> and I was really, really upset. And we wound up having a little tiff over it. And man, it was a very hot day and I slammed his door. I got up to go, well, fine, I don't, fine, boom. I slammed the door in the little uh, Datsun B210 and the window went, shh. <laughs> I broke the window. He said, now I'll never put your name on my car. <laughs> but I am here to tell you, I don't need my name on his arm or his arm. It's written in the palm of the Lord's hand. Okay? I got my own guy who's got his na my name tattooed in his arm, his hand. Yep. So David, you know, he says, what am I doing here? I'm just a dead dog. Why am I here? What do you have me here? And David says, look, today I'm going to show kindness to you. He says, I'm going to show kindness to you. And today you are going to eat not only for today, but for the rest of your life. You are going to sit at the king's table. You are going to eat the best of foods. I mean, you are going to eat at the king's table for the rest of your life. And Mephibosheth, he was just, he was restoring, David was restoring, going to restore to uh, Mephibosheth everything 
that had been taken from him. Everything that belonged to Saul, the king, and every, David's going to give back to him. Oh my gosh, can you just imagine for the years of stuff that Mephibosheth has coming to him? Well, he calls in his King Saul's servant, Ziba. He calls him in. He says, listen, Ziba, I want you to go out, you and all your sons. What did the Bible say? How many sons he had? How many? Yeah, no, he had one son, but Ziba had 15. So good, listen. Yeah. He says, um, Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. 35 people. 35 people he has. The whole size of the Landry family. <laughs> then Ziba says to then Ziba says to the king, Your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. Now remember, Saul hated David. He hated David. And his servants just knew what Saul felt about David. But now his servants, Saul's servants are serving David. And then he calls him into the table. Oh my gosh, the table is, he has never seen anything like it in his life. And his, he was five when he got crippled. He couldn't move. The only way he could get to the food was if somebody picked him up or somebody brought it to him. He couldn't go to the bathroom by himself. He could do nothing by himself because he couldn't walk. He was totally crippled. And here he's sitting at this gorgeous table. And um, I'm going to ask Derek to come share what was at the king's table. Okay. And just some of the things that are sitting at that king's we, table. We were talking about this the other day. It got good. And, you know, what I love about it is that because he was a Mephibosheth chef and he was in Lodabar, he still had an identity. Your, your identity defies who you are, not your location. Yeah. See, no matter what, no matter what, your kids are, uh, my, my kids are, my, my, the Weiss family, Landry, he's still a Weiss no matter what. He could be in the church, he could be out in the pig's pen, That's right. but he's still a Weiss. That's right. He's still Landry. Doesn't change his name. Doesn't change his identity. You are raw, and your identity never changes. Amen. And when Mephibosheth went back to David, when David brought him, that's the church. You see, David didn't go get him. He sent his service to go get him. That's you and I's job as we go in the field and we get the Mephibosheths. Come on. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. No, I can't. All right, let's go on. Let's do something else. I got one time a year, and you go and I didn't even it. know it. I didn't know it. I didn't even know it. Did you know? Okay, yeah, go. Well, we got, we got, we got, no, we got, we got a tag team. The table. That's All it. right, here we go. <laughs> table. The table. The king's table. <laughs> king's table. Every, listen, not everybody, if you went uninvited, you could have got killed. But David is a Christ. And David invites you to his table. Christ invites you to his invitation, to his table. And at the table, you and I can sup with him. David no longer... David, Mephibosheth can talk in fellowship with David because why? He is invited to sit at the king's table. You and I are invited and have been invited to sit at the king's table and guess what? You can sit there every day because why? You're the king's kid. Amen. What was it? It was provision. It was safety. He went from hopelessness to help. He went from hopeful to being helpful. He went from fearful to being faithful. He went from ashamed to being accepted. That's everything at the king's table. A security. The best. And he knew he belonged. 
He wasn't entitled, he was invited. He was not entitled, he was invited. Many people today think they're entitled to be at the table. Honey, you got to be invited. It's the kindness. It was, the ki it was this loving kindness that led me to repentance. The king's table was provision. It was safety. It was peace. It was identity that he, and guess what? He, Bilarinim invited me to be night on Monday night. But then you could come every Monday night. I went last Monday night. I don't have to ask him, am I invited tomorrow night, Brother Larry? No. Because why? He said, you can always come on Monday night to my table. You see, you don't, you don't have to ask, can I sit at your table tomorrow night? He said, my favorite chef, you will always sit at my table because you are family. Huh? Oh, she said, Whoa. Forget it. Forget it. No, 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 let's go back. Let's go back. Oh. Let's go back. Come on. Give, 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 give it more time. Come on. I just go. wanted to say um, that the Lord is going to restore, going to give you things that you didn't even work for. Come on. Just like Mephibosheth. He did not work for any of that land. That was his, his people's land. But he was down in Lodabar. And here, God has people. 35 people Worked are going to work for now. They're working for Mephibosheth. Amen. God is a God of restoration. Yes. yes. As a mom here today, a, mo a Mother's Day, here it is. Every child wants their, ch every mom wants their child restored back to the king's table. Amen. Yes. Amen. yes. Amen. That's a Mother's I Day dream. Amen. That, look, that, that my child will always sit at the king's table. No matter if they've been in Lodabar or whatever. God's looking for him because he says, my kindness is going out before you. Amen? Amen. And he says in Job 2.25, I will restore the years the locust and canker worm has eaten. God was restoring the years that were missed out. Lodabar, I mean, Mephibosheth had missed out in Lodabar. And God said, I know for years you should have been owed back things. You know what? God, when God does something, he gives back with interest and he gives back with recompense. Come on, we see that. He called them to the table. You know, in Luke 14, a parable was this, that Jesus said there was an invitation and he called the invitation to come out to a wedding feast. King's table. And he gave out invitations. And every and five and people gave excuses why they couldn't come. One was too busy, one was a henpecked husband, yada yada yada, all right? When Mephibosheth, when David's people called Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth gave every excuse why he couldn't be there. At least I could say Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth, Mephibi, Mephibi. But Phoebe, when Phoebe, when Phoebe went home, he gave an excuse, he gave an excuse why he couldn't come to the king's table. Everybody gives excuses why they can't come to the king's table. Everybody gives excuses why they can't come to church. But they said, hey, guess what? We'll pick you up and carry you if we have to. That's the body of Christ. Amen. And we have an invitation every day. And with the invitation, we get to come to the king's table. But you have to come to the king's table. What a place. You and I can sit at the king's table. Because you and I are a child of Christ. Amen. Why don't you stand to your feet? Amen. Any more? Any more? Any more? Okay, you got it. We're going to go. Wow, it was nice while it lasted. <laughs> Just shake it off here. Shake it off. Yeah, yeah, come on. No. You know, we, go ahead. You know, you gotta, go, go, go. No, go, I don't go. want to. This morning, there's an invitation. It's called an invitation to the cross. He gives us an invitation every week. It's called the cross. 
And he calls every day. And he asks you, Jesus says, come, come, come. For 20 years, I gave excuse, excuse why I couldn't come. And one day, the Holy Spirit, just like David, the Holy Spirit whispered in my ear. He says, why won't you go? You need to go to the cross. Because Jesus died for you. And you need to let him come into your heart. It's called repentance. And you and I, you have to open up your heart to allow the king to sit at your table. So I want you to today lift up your hands. It's called, it's called surrendering. And Lord, I just ask you right now, I surrender myself to you, Lord. I surrender my heart to you. I open the door to my heart and ask you to come in. He said, if you would open the door, he said, you would come in and fellowship with me. And so, Father, right now, I ask you right now, as we lift up our hands, I ask you, Lord Jesus, I say these words with me. Say, Jesus, I repent of all my sins, of all my failures, of all my excuses. And I know you died for me. And you shed your blood for me. And I have been forgiven. My sins were washed away. And there was white as snow. So with my mouth I confess. That you died for me. But on the third day. You rose again. So I ask you this day Jesus. To come into my heart. I am a child of God. In Jesus' name. Amen. You see, I want to encourage you. It doesn't matter where your location is. It matters who you are in Christ. You are king's kid, no matter what. You see, when your daughter's out in left field, she's still a king's kid. You see, her location didn't identify who, was, who she was because she was a king's kid. You were a king's kid. And the king is Jesus. David is a representation of Christ. He wants to show his loving kindness because his loving kindness caused you to repent. It was a loving kindness. It wasn't his wrath. It was true what my wife said. He didn't know when he went to David. David could have wiped him out. He didn't know because David, because David, Saul was, was, was hard on David. But David said, that was your father, but there's a heavenly father. Uh-huh. And David said, that was Saul, that wasn't me. I show you kindness. And that's, that is a representation of Christ. That he wants to show his loving kindness to you. Because his kindness brings favor, justice, and mercy. So I want to encourage you today. There's no need to be in Lodabar when you can be at the king's table. Amen. We're not going back to Lodabar. We're at the king's table. Oh. It's done. It's done. Amen. Listen. You be blessed today. You tell yourself, I'm at the king's table. And it's who I am in Christ. That's the last time I'll ever ask you to do that. <laughs> I, didn't even, I didn't know your notes. I didn't even look at your notes. I didn't know your anyway, notes. Anyway, um, thank you all for being with us this morning. And um, I pray that you all each have a fabulous day.